Well, good morning again, University Prez. This morning, if you are visiting with us uh, over the uh, past several months, we have been going through the book of Acts. So this morning, we come to Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 19. So Acts chapter 9, if you would take your Bibles or your mobile device and flip uh, or scroll your way down to Acts chapter 9. I must confess to you, brothers and sisters, a, uh, an unusually high degree of fear and trepidation that I have this morning before this uh, wondrous story. Uh, this is a story that I, I remember hearing as a child and uh, trembling before it and uh, coming to preach it, to proclaim it, um, the, uh, the, just the astounding story of, of Saul's conversion. Uh, who is sufficient for these things? Certainly not I. So I would covet your prayers this morning. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 19. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to Ananias in a vision, Ananias! And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man. How much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight then he arose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. Thus far God's word, that which is profitable for teaching and correction and rebuke and for training in righteousness. Let's pray. O oh Lord, as we come under the preaching of your word today, Lord, as your Holy Spirit goes out, as the seed is cast, O oh Lord, I pray that we would be awakened in our wonder, 
at the miracle of grace. Lord, we have all received your grace this morning. We are the recipients of that grace. And Lord, so often we confess that we don't wonder at its beauty. We are not amazed, Lord, at its infinite supply. And so, Lord, we pray that today we would all proclaim together amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Lord, in Saul, we pray that we would see ourselves and may the glory of Christ be seen in the face of Calvary. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the big rallying cries of the Reformation was the phrase, post tenebras lux, which means after darkness, light. For our Reformed forebears, this was a confession This was a declaration that even when things are most dark, God will not fail to reveal the light of his truth. Even when things seem to be shrouded in sin and unbelief, eclipsed by evil and corruption, God will make his truth, his righteousness, his love known. The shadows will not overcome the light. The light will prevail. And friends, we're living proof of that, aren't we? We're all witnesses to that. In that gentle phrase, after darkness, light, we see our own lives. We see our own history as a church writ large. We are those, aren't we? We are those who've been conquered by the light of the gospel. We have been seized by the power of a great affection, as Andrew Peterson puts it. We've been ushered from death to life, from rags to riches, from darkness unto light, from enmity with God to friendship with God. We are those who have been slain by a great interjection, a great eruption of grace. I've mentioned Tolkien's uh, word, eucatastrophe, before. In past sermons, Uh, eucatastrophe is basically the after darkness light of any good story. That sudden turn from total disaster and dissonance to joy. In fact, this is how Tolkien defined it. And as you hear this definition, think about the great eucatastrophe of your own walk with God. This also gets to the heart of our passage this morning, by the way. For Tolkien, you catastrophe is this. It's a sudden and miraculous grace. Never to be counted on to recur. It denies in the face of much evidence universal final defeat. Giving a fleeting glimpse of joy. Joy beyond the walls of the world. It pierces you with a joy that brings tears. However wild the events of a story, however fantastic or terrible the adventures, it can give to a child or a man that hears it, when that turn comes, a catch of the breath, a beat and lifting of the heart, it is a sudden glimpse of truth. When your whole nature chained in material cause and effect, the chain of death feels a sudden relief as if a major limb out of joint had suddenly snapped back into place. Friends, that is our story this morning. This astonishing account is indeed a sudden and miraculous grace piercing us with a joy that brings tears. The conversion of the Apostle Paul is probably the most well-known story in the book of Acts. And one reason it's so well-known is because Acts doesn't just tell it once, it tells it three times. 
It's one of those stories that's just so important. It's so foundational to the advancement of God's kingdom that it's worth retelling again and again. And why is that? Why is it so foundational? Well, not only does it provide the foundation for Paul's future ministry, but it's essentially a primer on conversion. Friends, this passage gives us a window into how God does what He does best, bringing sinners from darkness to light, making enemies of God into friends of God. This passage gives us the inside scoop on the great eucatastrophe of grace. Seven point sermon today. Seven points. Don't worry, we'll move fast. Believe it or not, I whittled it down from nine for the sake of time. Because I figured we'd want to have lunch eventually. So seven things about conversion that this passage reveals to us. Seven things about God's call to follow Him. First of all, it's surprising. Second, it's communal. Third, it's personal. Fourth, it's irresistible. Fifth, it's missional. Sixth, it's radical. And seventh, it's urgent. It's urgent. It's surprising, it's communal, it's personal, it's irresistible, it's missional, it's radical, and it's urgent. So if you know anything about Saul, you know that Saul was not exactly a great candidate for conversion. Humanly speaking, this story shouldn't have happened. As we know from other places in Acts, Saul came from a very strong Jewish pedigree, but he wasn't just Jewish. In fact, later on, when Paul describes his life B.C., before Christ, he often uses two adjectives to describe himself. He was strict, and he was zealous. He was strict, and he was zealous. That was Saul in a nutshell. Unlike the Samaritans from a couple weeks ago, Saul was born a pure-blooded Jew, a Hebrew of Hebrews from the tribe of Benjamin. Saul was brought to Jerusalem as a young child by strict Jewish parents, and needless to say, uh, Saul was an up-and-coming superstar in Jewish circles. He was trained under Gamaliel, uh, who was a close descendant of Hillel, which is one of the two great schools of first-century Judaism. And in Philippians, Paul tells us that he was, as to the law, a Pharisee. And back then, everyone knew what that meant. You didn't need to explain that. That was shorthand for, I was stricter than strict. You might think you're pretty strict. I was stricter than you. Paul had an unwavering allegiance to the Jewish law and the defense of strict rabbinical teachings. As Paul would say later on in Galatians chapter 1, he was extremely zealous for the traditions of their fathers. So that's all to say, again, this man was not exactly a great candidate for conversion to Christ, let alone becoming an apostle. Shouldn't have happened. As we come into chapter 9, he's nothing less than the archenemy of the church. He's the greatest threat that they have faced. When it comes to the exodus and conquest of the kingdom that is the book of Acts, this is the impenetrable Jericho wall of enemies. In verse 1, we're told that Saul is breathing threats and murder against the disciples. In other words, Saul isn't perpetrating just occasional acts of savagery against the early Christians. No, it's so constant. It's so ingrained into Saul's daily life. It's like he's breathing it. He's inhale, exhaling threats and murder. J. Alexander 
compares it to the panting and snorting of wild beasts. Animals just seething at their prey. Saul is leading, in other words, a persistent, systematic extermination of the early church. In fact, as we're told in verse 2, he even takes the initiative to expand his efforts to the church beyond Jerusalem. He collaborates with the high priest of Jerusalem, uh, Caiaphas, to pursue the arrest of saints as far out as Damascus, we're told, which is about 150 miles away, by the way. So you can imagine basically here to the Arizona border. It's far. This is the level of just sheer white hot grit and determination that inflamed Saul against the church. So this is the setting. Verse 3, Saul and his companions are going along the road to Damascus. Um, other places in Acts tell us that it was midday, about noon. So you can imagine a Middle Eastern sun at midday, sweltering, just blinding. It's one of those suns that you just can't imagine being outshined by anything else. So Saul is going along with his companions, and suddenly Luke tells us that a light from heaven shone around him, causing him to fall to the ground. Boys and girls, one thing uh, that I always look forward to out here in the desert is monsoon season, just because of the lightning show. Y'all know what I'm talking about, these heart-pumping bolts of lightning that will just light up the sky for hours. And sometimes you'll get that one that just shakes your bones, right? It's a really close one. It zigzags across the sky, and then just a millisecond later, just boom! You almost fall over. Well, when Luke says that a light from heaven shone around Saul, that's actually the same word used in other places in the Bible for a bolt of lightning. This lightning bolt light, this blast, this blinding blaze breaks into midday. It, it bursts onto the scene a light that is so bright, so effulgent, that it outshines the midday sun. But unlike lightning, it doesn't just flash, then it disappears. No, it's freeze-framed. It lasts for an entire conversation. Imagine that. And then imagine that instead of a thunderclap, a voice. A voice comes from the light. The voice of Jesus himself calling out. The first thing that he said since his ascension, by the way, he says, Saul, Saul. Now this tells us the first thing about conversion. It's surprising. It's not expected. It's not something you can engineer or manipulate into being. No, when it comes to God's call to raise a sinner from death to life, it's something God does in his timing, in his way, and for his purposes. Remember again, I know I'm a broken record for the third time. Saul is not exactly a shoe in for conversion. It's not like he was schooled in the teaching of the apostles, catechized in the Westminster Standards, just waiting for the right moment for the Holy Spirit to come and do his thing. No, he was like Jonah, remember going in the complete opposite direction from God. He was fighting God every step of the way. That is, until God showed up uninvited and unannounced and in an instant blew his entire world apart. Think about that. It happened in an instant. All of Saul's assumptions, all of his zeal, all of his confidence, all of the rationalization for his actions, his seething hatred for Jesus, all of it collapsed 
into a thousand tiny bits and fragments under the enormous weight of this revelation from heaven. The fact that this Jesus was alive. That he was the Messiah. That Stephen was right. Saul's entire world, all his learning, all his zeal, all his ambition turned to dust in an instant. He didn't plan for that. He didn't expect that. He didn't invite that. That wasn't part of his itinerary for the day. But that's what God does when he raises a sinner from death to life in an instant by God's sovereign act at the moment of his choosing the old passes away and the new comes. Rags turn to riches. Darkness turns to light. Saul, Saul, Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? Now that's a rather curious question that Jesus asks of Saul. Was he, in fact, persecuting Jesus? Wasn't he persecuting the church? So why does Jesus say this? Why does he say twice, in fact, in verses 4 and 5, that Saul is persecuting him? Well, because anything done to the church, Jesus takes personally. That's the reason. Anything done to the church, for good or for ill, Jesus takes really personally. This leads to the second thing about conversion. It's communal. You see, friends, this is the state of the relationship between Christ and his church. And this is one of those things that can really comfort us and really alarm us at the same time. Christ sees himself as so one with his body, the church, that to love one is to love the other, and to attack one is to attack the other. To mistreat the church in any way is to mistreat Christ himself. This is a hard thing for us to wrap our minds around, especially as consumers. Anything that we're a part of, from the local gym to just strolling around the mall, we tend to view our participation purely in terms of how it affects me. We put up very carefully designed boundaries around ourselves that shield us from any real responsibility. If I choose not to go to the gym, it doesn't really affect anyone but me. If I choose to shop at Old Navy instead of Gap, that doesn't really affect anyone but me. That's my choice as the consumer. I'm not hurting anyone. And you'd be right, usually. The problem is when we take that thinking into the church. When it comes to the church, a lot of Christians assume that my, effect, my, my actions affect no one but myself. If I choose to simply not attend or uh, to mistreat or to malign my neighbor behind their back, well, that's my choice. I'm not affecting anyone. I'm not hurting anyone. But here's the truth. What you do not only affects the body, it affects the head of the body for good or for ill. As Jesus said, you remember, what you do even unto the least of these, you do unto me. In other words, when you love your neighbor, when you clothe the sick, when you visit the imprisoned, as Jesus said in Matthew 25, you do so unto him, which is a beautiful thing. That's direct service to Jesus Christ. And yet, the reverse is also true. To mistreat the church is to mistreat Christ. To withhold yourself from your fellow Christians is to withhold yourself from Christ. To break your vows to this body is to break your vow to Christ. 
To malign members of this body in any way is to malign the one who gave up his life for this body. We need to think about that, fellow Christians. When Jesus saved you, he didn't make you into, uh, as Mark put it this morning in Sunday school, a lone ranger Christian. No, he made you part of something. He invited you into a body, a body that is inseparable from the head of the body. And so instead of always just minimizing our role in the church, always compartmentalizing, we need to think about how our actions, our words, our attitudes, even in private, affect not just the body, but Christ. Are we loving Christ? by how we treat others? Are we loving Christ by how we talk about others? Or are we persecuting Him? Those are the only two options. We're either loving Christ or we're persecuting Him. Now, conversion is communal. It's also personal. It's communal and it's personal. That's the third thing we see on the Damascus road. Back to verse 4. Notice, what is the first thing that Jesus says to Saul? How does he address him? Notice he says his name twice. Saul. Saul. Now that should remind us of something. You recall any other time in the Bible that God gives this kind of out of the blue greeting? Well, you should. It happens actually about 15 other times in the Bible. It happened with Abraham. It happened with Jacob. It happened with Moses. Remember the burning bush? Moses. Moses, God says. This is an intensely personal form of address. It's not just a general call to anyone in the vicinity. It's it's not God giving us generic, hello, anybody. No, it's a specific, personal, individual greeting. There on Mount Horeb, God wanted Moses. And here on the Damascus Road, God wants Saul. Boys and girls, let me tell you something that you probably already know. Your parents' faith is not a two-for-one deal. Your parents' faith can't get you into the kingdom. Now, when it comes to your relationship between you and Jesus, when it comes to your eternal destiny, each of you, by name, must believe. You can't ride the coattails of anyone else. No, you must bow the knee. You must give an account for the hope that lies within you. Not just your parents, not just your Sunday school teachers, not just your siblings. It's interesting that Christianity is called the way here in this passage. It's actually called this many other times later on in Acts 2. It's the same word for road or highway. Christianity is the highway, in other words. It's the road to God. And here's the truth. It's a road that each of us must walk. It's a journey that each of us individually must walk. No one else can walk it for us. Each of us must decide to take up our crosses and follow Each of us must decide between the broad road and the narrow road. Each of us must say at the end of the day that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, not just for someone else, but for me. For me. And I will walk that road. Can you say that today? God's call is surprising, it's communal, it's personal, fourth, it's irresistible. It's irresistible. Saul sees this blinding light, he hears the the voice, and notice what happens, his knees buckle. He is struck to the ground. 
And when he arises, verse 8, although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing, Luke says. Christian, here's the amazing thing about grace. When God forces his way in upon the heart of a sinner, when he calls a sinner to himself, when he chooses to awaken the spiritually dead, there's no resisting. There's a reason that in 2 Corinthians 4, Paul likens our conversion to day one of creation. When God said, let there be light. Because when God speaks into darkness, whether it's the darkness and void of creation or the darkness of the human heart, his voice is always heeded. When God says, let there be light, there's light. I love that scripture reading from earlier, Ezekiel 37. Uh, here's this whole valley of super dry, dead bones, like something out of a horror movie. That's us, by the way. We're that horror movie. And then God says to the prophets, speak, prophesy. Say, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And the prophet obeys. He speaks to the bones. And what does it say happen next? Behold, a rattling. Bones came together, bone to its bone. You see, that's what happens when God decides to make a sinner into a saint. That's what happens when God says, let there be light to a dead soul. He invades the soul with his word and spirit. And behold, a rattling. The soul, in other words, obeys his voice. God be praised. Now, why does this happen to Saul? Is it just to save him? Why, why does Saul receive this special visit from the ascended Jesus? Well, like some of those Old Testament revelations that I mentioned earlier, the purpose isn't just to convert Saul, but to send Saul, to commission Saul. Luke wants us to see this as a prophetic call to Saul, like that of Moses and Samuel before him. In verse 9, we see that Saul's mission has radically changed. Instead of going into Damascus to collaborate with the local synagogues to have uh, Christians arrested. Instead, he is sent into prayer and fasting for three days. And meanwhile, in verse 10, a man named Ananias is told in a vision to go and to meet with Saul in Damascus on a street called Straight. It's actually still a street in modern-day Damascus today. And Ananias is told to visit Saul on Straight Street, to lay hands on him and give him back his sight. Now in verse 13, Ananias is understandably skeptical of this, which is another feature of God's visions. They're often met with misgivings. Ananias obviously fears Saul and what he can do. So God reassures him. He says that Saul's mission has changed. Saul is no longer an enemy of God. He is God's instrument sent to carry Christ's name before the Gentiles and kings and sons of Israel. Now this slice of the story tells us another thing about conversion. The fifth thing, that it's missional. Friends, Jesus gathers Saul to himself to send Saul to the nation. Jesus is sending him on a new mission, a new calling, a new purpose here. To do what? What does Jesus say in verse 15? To carry my name. And then verse 16, to suffer for my name. In other words, the one who just persecuted the name will now give his life for that name. There's a lot of talk about the mission of the church the purpose of the church. We heard about it in Sunday school this morning. Well, this is it. 
the purpose-driven life, the purpose-driven Christian, the purpose-driven church, is to carry and to suffer for the name of Christ. This is our God-given mission, friends, and it hasn't changed over two millennia, like those angels on Jacob's ladder. God has called us upward to himself in order that he might then send us downward and outward to a world that desperately needs him. This is something we've been hearing about all through Acts. Christians being missional, churches being missional, is not optional. This isn't extra credit Christianity. No, this is core to our very identity. Not just getting the gospel right, which is super important, but to get the gospel out, which is also really important. So verse 17, Ananias goes to Saul as Jesus directed him. He puts his hands on him and he heals him. Then it says that something like fish scales fall from his eyes, Luke says, freeing him from his blindness. Now you ever wonder why Saul was struck blind in the first place? Why did that happen? Why was Saul blinded and that at midday when everything else was was bright? Well, God was exposing something in Saul that Saul had never been willing to admit before. His absolute dependence. That he was a debtor to mercy alone. We sang about it earlier. God was forcing Saul to his knees Not just physically, but spiritually. Remember, Moses prophesied that this would happen. Back in Deuteronomy 28, God told Moses that when the people disobey, when they turn from him, something's going to happen. They will be, listen to this, struck with madness and blindness and confusion of mind, and they shall grope at noonday as the blind grope in darkness. Isaiah, the prophet, talks about this too. In Isaiah 59, that when Israel turns from God, they will hope for the light and behold darkness. They will grope for the wall like the blind, like those who have no eyes. They will stumble at noon as in the twilight. You see, Saul is living out this curse on a physical level. For three days, Saul is forced to live under a covenant curse, stricken physically blind for his spiritual blindness. So that what? So that he might be humbled, so that he might turn to the Lord, and lo and behold, he does. And when he does, not only are his physical eyes opened, but his spiritual eyes as well. The curse is finally lifted. The blind can see. That's the sixth thing about conversion. It's radical. It's a total 180. It involves God taking the sinner from absolute independence to absolute dependence. In other words, we move upward to God by falling downward to our knees. That's how it works. William Willimon put it like this. We progress by regression. We go forward by falling backward. Such turning and helpless regression accompanied by blindness, confusion, speechlessness, hunger, and childishness is the very beginning of wisdom. As I was preparing this sermon, I was trying to think of an Old Testament parallel to Saul. Who in the Old Testament has a similar journey to Saul? And my mind was drawn to none other than Samson. 
Remember, Samson spent his entire life as a vagabond from God and his will. Despite being born into great privilege, he spent his days as a reckless, boastful prodigal. And yet what happened? He was stricken blind. And it was only then, it was only in his blindness that for the first time in his life, Samson could see. And the very act that killed him when he pushed those pillars to the side, he was being saved from the wrath to come. In the moments of his death, Samson was reborn. We'll see Samson in heaven, friends. Hebrews 11 says as much. That lustful, prideful sex fiend is listed in the hall of faith along with Abraham, Isaac, and Joseph, and Moses. Now, if we were honest with ourselves, that might make us scratch our heads a bit. I mean, did the author of Hebrews actually read Samson's story before inserting his name into that list? And yet here's the truth. I think the reason that we have difficulty with this isn't because we have too big a view of Samson's sin, but too small a view of God's grace. We don't see it for what it is. It's hard for us to even imagine how grace can be that relentless, that vast, that radical, to cover a lifetime of iniquity. How could God forgive such a filthy wretch, we think? But that's the miracle of grace. It conquers the unconquerable, even the Jericho wall of sinners. I love how Charles Spurgeon describes why Jesus died. You could sum it all up. Why did he die? Well, he died because of an excess of love. Spurgeon put it. He loved people too much. So much so that it was scandalous. An excess of love. You see, like the father of the prodigal son, Jesus will always open his arms to people like Saul and Samson. Even after years of rebellion, even to people like you and like me, that's the miracle of grace. That's the gospel. It's not God coming to save a bunch of pretty good people. No, it's God coming to save a bunch of Saul's and a bunch of Samson's, like you and like me. Grace isn't like your bank account. There's only so much in there, and there's only so much that you can withdraw at one time. No, that's not how grace works. With grace... There's a limitless supply. There's no cap on how much you can withdraw. And the best part is the ATM never closes. Good friends, it's never too late to call upon the Lord. It's never too late to look up unto the hills from whence comes your help and find full forgiveness and redemption. This leads to the seventh and final quality of conversion. It's urgent. It's not something to be postponed. We'll close with this. Wherever you are today, I urge you, whether you're young or old, you've been in the church for five minutes or 50 years, Call upon the Lord while he is near. As one with nothing but your sins in your hand, nothing to boast in, as one bereft of strength, as one defeated and broken and blind, call upon him as that, because that's who you are. Call upon him in your weakness, because in your weakness, our Jesus is strong. Call upon the Lord Jesus, friends. 
For now is the favorable time. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the day of your eucatastrophe. And as you do, rest assured that today is not the end, but it is a glorious beginning. As C.S. Lewis said, everything before, your life before, that's just the title page. Today, when you call upon the Lord, that's chapter 1. For Samson, his chapter 1 began in the hour of his death. For Saul, his chapter 1 began there on the Damascus road, there under the hand of Ananias. For you, that could be right now. Oh, friend, believe God is calling your name. Whatever you have done or not done, whether you're a young child or you're that thief on the cross with a life time of iniquity and regret behind you. Believe and be saved today. Oh, amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Let's pray. Our Father, the glory and the power and the beauty of the Gospel is seen so majestically in this story, in the conversion, the surprising awakening of this sinner, of Saul, to Yourself. And, O oh Lord, in his story we see ourselves. We see this call of the Holy Spirit, Lord, to follow Him. Lord, for any in this room that have not yet heeded that call, for those that have not said, yes, I will follow, Lord, I pray that You would work within them, that You would bring faith within them, Lord, that You would cause them to, to uh, come alive like those dry bones, that You'd be bringing them from darkness unto life, from rags to riches. O oh Lord, we pray that you would raise up sinners into saints even now at this moment. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.